Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti a questa terza sessione plenaria per, organizzata per questo importante congresso nazionale della sci che affronta un tema importantissimo, importantissimo per tutti ma importantissimo per noi chimici perché eh, affronta il problema della chimica in rapporto a i beni culturali, la diffusione della cultura, che sono eh, in qualche maniera estremamente connessi e eh, entrambi estremamente importanti. Perché se da una parte l'intento è quello di eh, far comprendere che eh, la chimica dà un contributo essenziale a ogni forma di cultura, è inutile ricordare Primo Levi, che eh, è stato chimico ed è stato scrittore e lui stesso diceva se qualcuno mi chiede perché io scrivo, nonostante sia un chimico, io gli rispondo io scrivo perché sono un chimico, perché ho imparato dalla chimica la maniera per scrivere in una prosa asciutta, precisa, eh, piena di, da, di, di dati eh, e di sensazioni. Ma eh, ovviamente la chimica è presente nei colori, eh, chi è stato alla Cappella Sistina ha visto che ci sono diversi tipi di illuminazione e che a seconda dell'illuminazione noi vediamo eh, più vividi i colori blu, i colori rossi, quindi l'interazione luce-materia è fondamentale per gioire delle opere d'arte intorno a noi. E la chimica ha sviluppato metodologie per eh, risolvere i problemi che sono connessi con l'inquinamento delle, delle nostre facciate, dello smog fotochimico, metodi importanti per il restauro, per il recupero di importanti beni eh, museali, architettonici. Quindi eh, noi come scienza di base diamo un contributo essenziale a sviluppare eh, quella materia di cui è fatta anche l'arte, a sviluppare nuovi materiali, Uh, sia per il recupero che per creare nuove forme di, uh, di arte. Quindi questo sarà un argomento importante che affronteremo oggi e poi affronteremo un tema altrettanto importante che è quello di farci conoscere, di diffondere la cultura della chimica, di diffondere quanto la chimica sia essenziale per trovare una chiave di lettura dei fenomeni naturali e in questo caso anche una chiave di lettura importante per leggere le opere d'arte, per curarle, per poterle riportare ai loro antichi splendori. Eh, sappiamo che la diffusione della cultura chimica è un problema molto serio che va affrontato anche come professionisti, perché non serve solo far vedere la chimica come luci, come colori. Questo è un aspetto importante che serve ad accattivarci eh, i ragazzi soprattutto. Ma quello che è veramente importante è far capire che la chimica è alla base di tutti i fenomeni naturali, non dal punto di vista solo come impressione, ma anche dal punto di vista delle regole che ci sono dietro, renderle comprensibili, diffonderle il più possibile, cominciando dalle scuole elementari, perché lì comincia l'interesse per la sperimentazione, per individuare delle forme anche creative di avvicinarsi alla scienza e proseguire dopo anche con un pubblico non specialistico, c'è stata una interessante eh, rilievo, rilevazione della Royal Society of Chemistry rispetto alla diffidenza che si ha nei confronti della chimica. E questa è, è meno forte di quella che sembra, però sicuramente eh, la maggiore causa di questa diffidenza era legata alla cattiva informazione, cioè le persone che avevano paura della chimica e perché leggevano della chimica su non riviste specializzate, non si ascoltavano comunicatori che erano scienziati, ma leggevano su internet e quindi si erano formate un'idea completamente sbagliata. Quindi noi abbiamo un ruolo importante nel trovare le forme per arrivare a far comprendere bene, correttamente la chimica, soprattutto direi eh, anche alle ai ragazzi e soprattutto alle donne giovani che in questo momento sono quelle che meno si avvicinano allo studio delle materie come la chimica, come la fisica o perlomeno se anche si avvicinano poi sono quelle che meno facilmente fanno carriera. Per parlare di questo quindi noi avremo oggi tutte e due eh, le forme, avremo da una parte interventi che ci tenderanno a far capire il ruolo della chimica e dei chimici eh, nelle varie forme dell'arte e anche nel recupero e nel ripristino della 
eh, del nostro patrimonio artistico-culturale e poi avremo una interessantissima tavola rotonda in cui eh, giornalisti e divulgatori si confronteranno per cercare di affrontare il ruolo di come deve essere la comunicazione per far passare il giusto messaggio. Eh, io adesso passerò ovviamente all'inglese dando la parola al mio collega, il professor Gianluca Farrinola, per presentare il nostro primo speaker. Uh, Gianluca, the microphone is yours. Good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much Angela for leaving me the stage. Uh, and it's, uh, there could be not better way to, uh, to discuss about chemistry and culture today than starting with a plenary lecture of Professor Roald Hoffman. I have the honor to introduce this lecture, or I should better say, using his word, to introduce all of you, all of us, to the Roald Hoffman's land between chemistry, poetry, and philosophy. The entire scientific life and intellectual adventure of Professor Roald Hoffman is in fact a space where the border between chemistry and science more in general, art and culture, vanishes, leaving room to the pure genius speculating on the deeper significance of human investigation on nature and the universe through art and science and on its responsibility and value for the progress of mankind. Professor Roald Hoffman was born in Poland. After having survived the Second World War, he got to the US in 1949, where he studied chemistry at the Columbia and Harvard universities. Since 1965, he's Uh, at Cornell University as Frank Rose Professor of Humane Letters, uh, now Emeritus. Applied theoretical chemistry is the way Professor uh, Hoffman likes to characterize the particular blend of computations stimulated by experiments and the contribution of generalized models of frameworks for understanding chemistry and molecular and matter at the molecular level that is his major contribution to chemistry. In more than 600 scientific articles and two books, he has taught the chemical community new and useful ways to look at the geometry and the reactivity of molecules from organic to inorganic and infinitely extended structures. He received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1981 with Keniti Fukui for the for their theories developing independently concerning the course of chemical reaction. Although when one says Nobel Prize, of course, every other awards of the impressive list of Professor of, uh, of Roald Hoffman may appear less important, still I like to mention that he is member of the National Academy of Science, but also of the American Academy of Art and Science and of the American Philosophical Society plus member of an impressive number of national societies. He is the only person ever to have received the American Chemical Society Awards in three different subfields of chemistry, organic, inorganic, and chemical education. It seems like the Nobel Award is not the top achievement for Professor Hoffman when he says that he considers his pinnacle that his name was used as a clue in the New York Times March 12, 2011 crossword puzzle, which is irony, of course, but also an example of his strong interest in societal and ethical engagement of a scientist. Examples uh, are his participation in the production of a television course about chemistry, uh, the world of chemistry, which uh, really uh, helped to, to reduce the gap between chemistry, scientific speeches, and the general public. He's also a writer, and not only about science. He has published several collections of poetry and books uh, and philosophical writings. Examples are Roald Hoffman on the philosophy, art and science of chemistry, and Beyond the Definite, the sublime in art and science. Chemistry Imagined is a unique art science literature collaboration of Roald Hoffman with the artist Vivian Torrens. He also wrote plays where he dramatizes uh, the conflict of scientists and researchers in front of the ethical consequences and impact of their studies. In the Roald Hoffman intellectual adventure, chemistry is a starting point, 
but also a unique constant perspective in addressing ethical and social responsibility, in exploring its inter inherently poetic and humanistic side and, the communica and in communication with the general public, which he considers a, ma a major duty of scientists as we share. As he said in an interview with Liberato Cardellini in 2007 during the UPA conference held in Torino, the middle is interesting inherently and chemistry is a science in the middle. A central science, as we say in our uh, Società Chimica Italiana conference in 2001. So welcome, Professor Hoffman, on behalf of myself and all the Italian Chemical Society, and we are looking forward to your lecture. <clears throat> um, um, thank you, Professor Farinola. I also want to mention that I am very proud of having been the first recipient of a Primo Levi Award by, given jointly by the German and Italian Chemical Societies. Um, and I'm very proud of that. Um, now I need to see my slides. And so there is the usual technical little interlude while we get those up, please. Do I need to share the screen? Yes, please. Uh, I guess the screen is already shared. You should just uh, click on the slides. Click on the slides. Now, the only problem is that I don't see the slides. Um, so let's see, to the technical people, can you make, can yeah, you uh, have it so that I can see uh, the slides? You should have the uh, small icon of PowerPoint on the uh, bottom stripe, maybe. This is what they are suggesting. Yes, I can advance it. Okay. Now, if you put me back to the uh, to the meeting, will I be able to see this? If you yes, you are on live, and everyone can see your presentation now. Okay. So tell them that we can start. Let them uh, announce that when the start begins. Good. So we are already online and uh, Professor Hoffman, we are ready to listen to your lecture. Uh, yes. We can, we can um, see. Thank you for the introduction. I'm sorry about uh, the technical problems. I want to tell you a little bit about protochemistries. And then there is a little bit of an addendum. The protochemistries is a word I invented. It's not a misspelling of photochemistry. It's a word for, uh, for chemistry before there were professional chemists. And so I want to talk about that. Uh, so these are transformations of matter which were accomplished in sometimes in prehistoric times, sometimes fairly recently. For human beings appear to have been fated for good and for bad to transform matter in some way. We will not take only what nature gives us. We are tool makers. And in the process of various professions and crafts and skills, and here you see a list of winning metals from their ores, a very basic one, of cooking, of making medications to heal ourselves, ceramic dyes, cosmetics, jewelry, pigments especially, but also tanning leather and the use of soap, creating objects of veneration. People have, in one way or another, learned how to transform matter. And in that went in, first of all, curiosity and the desire to do so. And second, 
a patience in order to perfect the methods which were not perfect and other things that you'll see. I want to tell you about this. And the easiest thing is to, to give you an example. Here is one. So uh, he, this is from Andean metallurgy. From The Andean word here I use with all apologies to a great citizen of Genoa rather than the uh, term pre-Columbian, which in some ways does not recognize the skills of these peoples. We know usually the Inca who ruled for all of a hundred years, but before the Inca, there were a number of cultures called Moche, Wari, and Chimo in this region extending from Colombia south into Chile. And they perfected a number of the crafts and incredible skills in certain artistic and craft objects. Ceramics, here you see some examples of their ceramics, representational, expressive, even humorous, uh, abstract or, or images of people. Uh, they were able to do that. The textile crafts were absolutely remarkable. And here we are lucky that the climate of the, uh, of the region preserved many of these textiles for us. Again, abstraction and representation an incredible skill in manipulating the dyes and the textiles involved. But it is especially in metallurgy that their skill was demonstrated. Here are some objects from Lima, uh, and the particular strength was in objects made from copper, silver, and gold, and of alloys of these. And these they perfected. And the story I'm about to tell you that an a metallurgist, archaeologist, Heather Lechtman, whose picture I showed, um, demonstrated is a remarkable thing. It's a very specific story. There's this little idol just a few centimeters high, and on the outside it's golden, gilded. But if you look in the backside of it, there is corroded copper. So Lechtman took a sample, which you see at right, and I don't have a scale on it, but you'll have to believe me that that thin layer on top, which is gold on copper, that thin layer is uh, two to three microns thick, looking for all the world like it had been electroplated. This day uh, dates from the Moche culture and from about 800 of our era. Uh, and it, there were no batteries there. Uh, and so how did they get it on? Well, part of it is pretty easy and it involves some basic chemistry. This is why these stories, in addition to being good stories, detective stories, are things we should tell our parents because our students, I mean, they, they help us understand uh, the, the science so well. I mean, here are the standard electro potentials, and you can see from where gold three going to gold is that almost anything in the world will reduce gold three to gold metal, and very few things will attack gold metal. Only F2 and ozone and hydrogen peroxide, those are not normal chemicals in nature. Uh, and so gold remains gold and does not corrode in contrast to iron, copper, and everything else. So when a tomb is excavated archaeologically, the objects made of bronze and copper are corroded. The objects from wood are gone, but the gold gleams like it is on the day it was put into that tomb. And so the problem was not having the gold, which they had, not in abundance, but they had it in those Andean cultures. The problem is getting the gold into solution because once you have it in solution, if you dip some copper in it, like that idol, the gold would plate out in a thin layer. The thin layer would not be stable in a solid state way and would need to be annealed. But that is what they learned to do. 
they had the temperatures enough, Leichtman has demonstrated, high enough in order to anneal that gold layer into place. The problem was how did they get gold into solution? So in medieval times, the alchemists invented aqua regia, a mixture of uh, the strong mineral acids, hydrochloric and nitric acid, and this indeed dissolves gold, forming the soluble tetrachloroaurate ion, golden oxidation state three, and so the, how to get the golden solution, because after that you could plate it out. Well, what Lechtman did was to reconstruct uh, the chemistry that the Andean metal workers did, and it involved a formation of a solution that duplicated, to use modern language, the ionic atmosphere of an aqua regia solution, which contains chloride, nitrate, and strong acid. That's the essence of aqua regia. And they had chili saltpeter, which is potassium or sodium nitrate. Everyone had salt, sodium chloride. The key ingredient which she found was that they had sources of alum, which is a potassium aluminum sulfate and strongly acidic. Uh, those of you of a certain age will remember we used to carry around little things called styptic pencils, which were used to when we cut ourselves in shaving, um, and uh, those are made out of alum. They produce a strong acid. This mixture with, so what does it have? In addition to the chloride and nitrate, it has also sulfate and the potassium ion, and all these things are innocent bystanders in this, but essentially this mixture reproduces what, uh, what aqua regia does. It dissolves metallic gold, which was obtained by these people from, uh, from panning for gold, the same methods that were used, primitive methods. They didn't have, uh, only later was mercury developed as an amalgamation process for extracting gold and cyanide still later. At left below, you see the little micrograph of a sample from that idol. At right, you see uh, Lechtman's recreation of a similar surface of copper dipped in gold in a dip. Uh, first of all, the gold dissolved according to this mixture of nitrate, of potassium nitrate, sodium chloride, and alum. And then uh, the uh, copper dipped into that, the gold plating out, the gold annealed to get this. It's a, it's a complete recreation. This is not absolute proof that that is what was used, but it's pretty good as things go. The Andean cultures had immense control over metallurgy. Here is something they did, which was so clever. This immense golden mask. This mask here is 74 centimeters across. That's an incredible amount of gold. That gold was initially started out as an alloy, which they knew, which was gold, silver, and copper. Pretty, uh, pretty expensive by itself, tumbaga. That sheet was hammered, and the hammering used a principle which I have worked on recently of materials under high pressure. So of those copper, silver, gold in an alloy, the gold is the most dense, a density of over 19 grams per centimeter cube. If you hammer a sheet of that alloy, the gold segregates out to the person, to the place under the hammer, and you get an aggregation of gold to that surface that is being hammered. And then they were able to find selective procedures for taking off the copper and the silver from this to leave the gold on the surface of this mask. It's a, this depletion gilding as it's called is a remarkable process. Okay, here is something else. Uh, we are now leaving the Indian metallurgy only full of admiration. 
here is uh, a just a one slide presentation of something uh, that we uh, that is used to this day to make uh, a uh, edible material a flower from uh, the root of the cassava or manioc if you've been to brazil you will know that in brazilian cuisine farofa is used very often this is a uh, a finely particles of cassava or manioc that has been dried however this root which grows both in the brazil region and in africa is if consumed directly from the plant uh, is in fact poisonous and the reason it's poisonous we know how it acts through modern biochemistry it has some sugars which are connected to a substituent that you see here uh, that is that has in it a cyano group this lets loose the cyano group and that does the damage these are called cyanogen cyanogenic glucosides linamarin and they're easy to get out by simply boiling up the root in water, but then you have to squeeze out all the water and dry the root again before consuming it. Um, so this process of discovering that you had to boil up the root, pieces of the root in uh, water and then throw away the water and being very careful to squeeze out the water. What you see here is someone looking at a uh, device which was used by twisting a very ingenious device, uh, somewhat like uh, we had a Chinese finger trap for catching two fingers, we used to call it. It was a children's toy uh, where by twisting you, the, the, it constrained the object in between. It's something we use to this day to, to dry objects. And uh, this was uh, used to form the safe cassava and manioc, which then would be put into the flour, which is used as farofa. Let me talk a little about the blue. And I could go on about, about blue for quite a while. We're into pigments now. And here are three, um, three masterpieces of world civilization, a painting from Luxor and Thebes at left, the gate of Ishtar in the middle, which uh, stood in Babylon, but then through a feat of imperialism for a change not American, uh, wound up in Berlin where you can see it today. And at right, you see a Hellenistic wall painting from Upper Egypt a period of realistic representation, as you can clearly see here, with its masterpieces preceding the Italian Renaissance by a thousand years. Uh, this is now from about the second or third century of our era. The blue in these, there was always a natural blue available. It was very expensive and it was powdered lapis lazuli or ultramarine a mineral that with limited availability, uh, when artists had patrons who could afford it, they used this ultramarine. So for instance, uh, the Giotto um, paintings in the Scroveni Chapel in Padua are, uh, are using ultramarine. Uh, other people and all of these three works of art that you see here. Every one of them used a product of chemistry and of commerce called Egyptian blue, manufactured in Egypt and elsewhere eventually, and a byproduct initially, or a product of the Egyptian mastery of glass making. It's essentially a glass frit where the um, coloring element is a copper salt, one or another one, like azurite or malachite in these. And the structure is well known and today. Uh, it, it's in silicate uh, with copper oxide, typical square planar copper 
planes that you see here, uh, which are of interest electronically. This is Egyptian blue. This was sold around the Mediterranean uh, during uh, the an times of antiquity, and it was used in all of these. I want to talk, however, about something that was used to color fabrics, because uh, that that Egyptian blue could not be used on textiles. So there's a lesson here about different materials demanding different dyeing techniques. The Tyrian purple uh, went through shades from purple, in fact, to blue, depending on a dyer's art and depending on the organisms that were used to produce it. Uh, you know of its role in Roman culture. Here is a mosaic from Ravenna that shows the cloak of the emperor in Tyrian purple here. Uh, I, just for fun, I found this in searching for an image. I found these weird cards made by, of all things, by Liebig, not the chemist Liebig, but the company that he, that he found based on his work, which was an, a, a meat extract. And they published these pictures, which I was looking for a picture of an emperor dressed in the Tyrian purple. And this is what I found. It's rather amusing. The Tyrian purple, controlled very tightly by Roman edicts, uh, and made I'll show you where Tyre is, the city of Tyre, in just a while. It also played a role in the Israelites' um, culture. A pigment, a ritual blue, uh, appears in one part of the Book of Numbers, and it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelite people, instruct them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of the garments throughout the ages. Let them attach a cord of blue to the corner. So the corners here of these fringes are in an undergarment, which uh, observant religious Jews uh, might wear, and which you've seen little boys running around with those fringes hanging out. You will notice that most of the people today who wear those fringes, the fringes are all white. And so the ability to make the fringes blue was lost around 600 AD, along with the loss by the Roman sources of the Tyrian purple around the same time. Not that the organisms disappeared which make this, so they come from snails. They come from three species of Mediterranean snails. Murex is the most prominent one in the middle. Over down at lower left, you see a coin of the city of Tira, Sur in Arabic, uh, from about 200 of our era. And if you go down to the bottom of the coin, you see the foundation myth of um, Tira, which is that Hercules' dog found this, uh, found this shell and he bit into it and his mouth was colored purple. So, um, Notice that the, that little sculpture of the shell on that coin, it's all of about two millimeters high. That's pretty good representation of the shell that is uh, the, of the snail that is the source of the Tyrian purple, purpura. And uh, this uh, purple was then used. Now, these snails are not very pleasant things. They are carnivores. They don't attack humans, but they attack other snails. They are veritable factories of chemical aggression, uh, and uh, they, in them there is a gland called the pedigial gland. You see here the needle pointing to it. The gland has been dyed. It's about perhaps at most uh, about eight millimeters long a millimeter or two wide, and in that is produced some yellow pus-like material. Here it has been dyed dark. And if you break the shell, and you have to break the shell and kill the snail in order to extract this material, if you squeeze out some of that material 
under the action of sunlight and air, it turns into a blue, a vivid blue, which stains your fingers and your hand, if you put it, for about a day or two. So you cannot make a fabric out of it because after a day or two it or a few washes, it washes out. So there is another step which involves some chemistry which I cannot tell you about, which the dyer cra dyers, the craftsmen, invented, which involves a taking that particular blue dye, which that blue which was extracted painstakingly from the shell. It took something like 10,000 shells to dye an emperor's toga with the Turian purple. Um, one can, uh, one takes that blue and then one dissolves it in some, what today would be called a reducing agent, but they used urine. So it turns out that urine ch changes from acidic to alkaline uh, if it stands around for three days. So old urine. If you go to Pompeii, you will see the urns that were used to collect the chemicals for the next day's work, the dyers things, whether in Pompeii or in Fez in Morocco today, the dyers quarters are not very well smelling things. Uh, the chemistry was there. It's actually quite amazing. They went through this reduction step and then the oxidation, regenerating the blue of the pure indigo, which is what it was, and dibromo indigo, was obtained by using the reducing, the oxidizing power of the oxygen in the air. So the last step was easy, but until then, they had to find other chemistries. These shells, the production of these was around the Mediterranean. There's a wonderful book, which I recommend to you, by Dominique Cardon, which has a story of both the nature and the biology, but also of, of the chemistry of a variety of dyes. And here the dark dots show places where the, there was production of the Tyrian purple or the Tehelet, which was used by the Hebrews, and where Tira is along, is along the coast of present Lebanon. Where there were this production, there were immense shell dumps. There was a pollution problem. I have stood in those shell dumps in an unusual place, which is in the south of Tunisia. It's one of those dots in this picture um, over here. That's the island of Jerba. Uh, and there are, these, uh, there are these shell dumps there from the production of the, of the purple. These shells occur around the world and there were independent rediscoveries of this process of making the blue in the China-Japan region and in South America. And in fact, the blue in these cloths is in part from, from, from uh, in some of it is from the snail source. The rest of it comes from another source of the blue that was there all along, and that is plants of the indigo family at left, and then a plant that grew in much more temperate climates, Isatis tinctoria, which is called in English woad, Weid uh, in German, pastel guado, Vaida, uh, all over Europe, this plant grew and was the source of a blue. It's the light, you see the light blue region here is the uh, places where woad, this uh, other plant producing indigo blue uh, grew and it reaches up into Southern Scandinavia. Uh, so it is very widespread. Incidentally, the use of the blue in a textile is actually been documented even earlier than its use in most, in, in the place that wins most records for the oldest use of technology, which is of course Egypt, uh, because there, are, there is a sample of indigo blue from Peru in a woven textile that was, uh, comes to 6,000 years ago. 
It became an industry here from Diderot, D'Alembert's Encyclopédie is uh, some of that. Uh, and, and it became part of science. When uh, Bayer in 1883 got the structure of indigo, dibromo indigo here shown, uh, that's the purplish end of the range is the, the bromine compound and the brominated compound and, and BASF very soon made quantities of this. Uh, this is a story that intersects with that of the aniline dyes and eventually leads to this, uh, which is not a story of the Berlin Wall, but, but really a story of the popularity of genes. Um, young people should be grateful for chemistry. Two billion pairs of genes are made worldwide every year and into each go to two to three grams of synthetic indigo uh, into dyeing them to be washed out for the most part. It's not a very happy story in some ways. Uh, it's a story of waste, but uh, it is a story which enables an icon of modern culture. I was going to tell you a story of lead and I'll do it very briefly. Uh, it's, it's a story with Italian connections. And this is uh, that, of course, the Romans loved to take baths. And so uh, here you see a bath from England. They moved the water in lead pipes. So they had a technology for making lead and they made metallic lead in vast quantities. I'll show you in a second how vast they were. They made it by taking galena, smelting it to the sulfate or uh, to, to lead oxide, and then reduced, removed the oxygen uh, with charcoal to lead. These were not very good processes. You can see a description of this in the Juvenalia uh, chapter on lead in uh, the periodic table, one of the classics of our time. Uh, and I'm very proud to have this association with Primo Levi through that award that I mentioned. Um, my daughter worked in, a, in Greenland and here she was digging ice cores in Greenland. Those ice cores, this is not exactly her work, but she did, she did something else with ice cores. These ice cores have been analyzed for their lead content, among other things. And here is a paper in science from a few years ago, uh, 26 years ago, which is an analysis and a dating. These, lead these ice cores can be dated just like tree rings, uh, not as accurately as tree rings, but approximately they can be dated. And so they can see the amount of lead in the where is the lead coming from? Lead has is actually somewhat volatile. So it's actually coming from the atmosphere. And here is the result of that work. And what you, this is a strange scale where you go years ago from years from the present going back, increasing to the right. And you see the points that they have. I want you to see the vertical axis, which is, uh, picograms per gram of ice. That's incredible analytical chemistry that's being done here. And here is a repro reproduced scale of world lead production, which uh, is, uh, comes from these studies, an estimate. But uh, what you see here is not until 1750, and that is the beginning of approximately of the Industrial Revolution, does the amount of lead in the atmosphere that landed in Greenland but originated probably in Europe, we can't blame China for this, it originated in Europe and it probably originated from Roman lead production. Uh, it was not until the beginning of the Industrial Revolution that the amount of lead in the ice exceeded that produced at the height of the Roman production of lead, which was around 
uh, around uh, the birth of Christ here. And so that you see it, the incredible power of, of chemistry, both to make that lead, even though it was dirty chemistry, but also the detective stories to determine it. So these are proto-chemistries. And I could tell you much more. I have, I have slowly been assembling materials on these proto-chemistries. They are incredible stories. I have assembled them for teaching purposes when I taught, but I have collected them also just for myself. But what is the moral of these stories? So I think there is a strong moral. One is that aside from there being interesting stories, these stories stress the essential importance of experiment. And this is a theoretician talking to you. They underline that you have to try things. And they did, those people. And they stress also the importance of the underlying economics that governs much human activity. That pigment was sold uh, in ancient times to make the blue. These stories render homage to the past, to the ingenuity of human beings. You don't have to be trained at a university to be ingenious, to know how to do something. They connect our world, I think. The world then, the world now, the world of working people and of scientists. I think these stories normalize science in a sense the people who did this did not think they were scientists. They did, but yet they transformed matter. And as I've said before, and what is behind my invitation here and this session is they put the chemistry in the context of world culture. There is chemistry and culture. There must be culture and chemistry. It's interesting to explore that. Uh, now comes the addition, and it's a little contemporary story. It's not ancient chemistry. It's chemistry, but that's not the interesting thing about it. It has to do with a recent analysis, and some of you may have read this, but many of you have not. You know there is this iconic portrait of Jacques -Louis, by Jacques-Louis David of the Lavoisier couple. They were not aristocrats really, but they were uh, very wealthy and they could commission this, this portrait and paid something of the order, the equivalent of a half million dollars for having this gigantic portrait, three meters high, painted uh, by uh, David. The painting is in the Metropolitan. You can see this. Everyone knows what's in it. Uh, it it happens that the Metropolitan has a Department of Scientific Research. I'll tell you more about it. The one reason I show this to you is because in Italy, there is a center of studies in Lavoisier in the work of Marco, Marco Beretta at the University of Bologna, who is a world expert on specifically the iconography of Lavoisier, how Lavoisier is represented, what objects were in his laboratory and what is their source. Uh, so it is a very interesting to him. So this was examined. And the first clues were from an IR reflectogram, non-invasive. And what you see here, if you look at the ta red tablecloth, that red tablecloth was painted in late. And before that, there was a table. You see the decorated table edge. And you see Lavoisier's second leg under it you see an outline of a globe over at the right, which wasn't there initially. Turns out that they, from other things, they can prove that all the scientific instruments were painted in late. There was a bookcase at upper right. There is a smudge across, which is a clue of more to come, across Madame Lavoisier's hair. Um, and so they were encouraged to look further and to look closely. So first, they just looked visually. So up here, near Madame Lavoisier's hair, um, somewhere up there, near her head, you see her lock of hair here. When you enlarge it, you see something red 
peeking through cracks in a very good overpainting. But still, there are cracks in it, and there's something red underneath. You see on Madame Lavoisier's right arm a blue ribbon. If you look at that blue ribbon, there's a big crack, and you can microscopically see the red in it. And here is what it looks like. That blue was overpainted over a red. So interesting, red gone from the tablecloth, red up in the wall behind her, red in the ribbon that she's wearing. There were, there were major changes being made. Then the real uh, answer or rather information came from macro X-ray fluorescence. So this is X-ray fluorescence, a Brooker instrument. Please don't ask me how much this cost because it cost, as we say in English, an arm and a leg. And everyone would love to have this toy. It's a rather simple looking X-ray instrument using a rhodium target, which allows you to sweep automatically across a large area and look element by element a little below the surface, also in the surface. And here is where the revelation came. So now let me explain a little bit. The white in the picture at right, which came from that X-ray fluorescence, uh, that X-ray reflectometry. The white is a classical lead ox lead white, uh, a white pigment. Uh, what's more interesting is the red at right, because that red is a map of the mercury under the surface. And the red is from vermilion, HGS, which could be natural, could be synthetic by that time. Both were in use. And there is, you see here, a remarkable hat painted on Madame Lavoisier's uh, head, uh, and then over painted for the final drawing. You see here the globe very clearly. Uh, you the and also there is evidence which I don't have time to go through for uh, that the that the scientific instruments were painted afterwards here in uh, there there's also other element maps which reveal other pigments but clearly there was a fashionable hat now women's fashions were a big item for the rich people in in France at the time and the fashions changed very rapidly and they were published in magazines, not very different from the magazines that you get in the mail, which are essentially catalogs for sales and such. Here, for instance, from a monthly uh, of new modes in France is a lady with a hat. And this is from 1980, 1787 a year before the Lavoisier paint, uh, portrait was finished. And you see that hat looks awfully similar to what Madame Lavoisier is wearing. The feathers are different, uh, but the hat overall is very similar. Um, this is not science here. This is good curate, uh, artistic curation. At right is a drawing, a recreation of what we have learned from these, what the people at the Metropolitan have learned from this painting, which was finished in December 1788. Now I want you to put the time with political events in context. The monarchy was under fire already. The storming of the Bastille was just seven months ahead. Uh, the beginning, the violent beginning of the French Revolution, but changes were already in the air when the estates refused what the people wanted. And so what we see very clearly, and I don't have to tell you, is a change in the portrayal of the Lavoisier couple from being a fashion plate, 
rich people enjoying their things. There are still interesting things. There are interesting things about why Madame Lavoisier is so prominent, why he is in her shade in a number of ways. But what you see is a change in portrayal from what there was originally to a professional scientist and a woman who had studied with Lavoisier, uh, an artist, and this was a period in which women artists were beginning to be recognized. Uh, and here is what we don't know. We don't know who decided on the change. Was it David? Was it the Lavoisier couple? Was it both? We don't know. There is no evidence at this point. Maybe something will come out. And now, the last point I want to make is uh, really a point I would make to the, to the ministries in Italy rather than to you. I told you that this work was done by the Department of Scientific Research of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I happen to have the good fortune of being the co-chair of the advisory committee to that museum, which is why I knew about this work one year ago. And I was sitting on pins and needles, as they say, to be able to tell people about it. But I couldn't until it was published, which was last month. The laboratory is headed by Marco Leona, who was educated at, I think, in Pavia, and then has gone on to a productive career in art, uh, science, conservation, and science connected to art. And here you see the staff. If you run down this list, you will see a large number of Italian names, okay? The point I would make to your ministries is why are why do these people have to work in New York? Uh, or why aren't they in Italy? Oh, congratulations for training these people. No doubt in the audience are some of the people who have trained these very good scientists. But uh, there is something to think about. And with that, I finish. And I hope I have shown you some good stories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Hoffman, for this wonderful lecture. Thanks a lot for uh, making it so interesting. We all enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for making us think that we are toolmakers and that chemistry was in mankind well before chemists were born. We just now have tool for toolmakers helping to uh, uh, increase understanding and taking responsibility. And thanks a lot for your last topic, pointing out a very interesting story, which is the one of Madame Lavoisier, and another very inter interesting story, which is why Italians are so good in training people and also so good in letting, get, letting them go outside Italy. This is a big challenge for all of us as professors, but also as Italian Chemical Society, because um, we produce chemists, of course, and we train chemists, and we are engaged in defending the chemical culture in Italy. Thanks a lot, Professor Hoffman, on behalf of all the Italian Chemical Society for being with us today. Thank you.